And that actually helped me a lot after that, just that one moment, because I approached martial arts and everything after that, much more humble attitude mm -hmm. is like, what can I learn? Who can I learn? You know, who can I learn quality stuff from and actually, you know, implement that. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome. It's an episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thanks for spending some time with us. Today, I'm joined by Michael Garner, and we're going to have a good time. If if we have half as good of a time as we did training together yesterday, this is going to be a good episode. Absolutely. Yeah, awesome. yeah I, I, I had fun with you. But before we get to that, just a reminder, if you're new to the show, whistlekick.com for everything we do as an organization, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for everything we do for this show. And a special shout out to Kataro for sponsoring this episode. K-A-T-A-A-R-O.com is where you want to go for the best belts in the world, as well as some fun stuff like this hoodie, right? You were, you were saying you love this saying, it's best to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. You know, they've got this great hoodie. Uh, I carry around my, we did a collaboration on belts, right? Like the belt that I wear almost every time is that great Kataro belt, that black, white, what I call the yin yang belt. They call it something else, but uh, it's awesome. And there's a belt bag that they made, and I carry the belt in that. And they just do so much great stuff. And they're really supportive of not only what we do, but the martial arts industry as a whole. Use the code WK10 at checkout on your first order. Save 10% at Kataro.com, K A T A A R O.com. And thank you again to Kataro. Michael, thanks for being here. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Yeah. So here we are. Uh, we are at Kiai Martial Arts in Puyallup, Washington. I'm pretty sure I said that close, but not perfectly. That's okay. Free Training Day Pacific Northwest, the third annual event up here. And we're in CJ's office. Some of you who have been around for a while you might say, I recognize that, that office. Yeah, we did a few episodes last year. We're doing some episodes this year. It's a good good place and we had a good time yesterday yeah thanks for thanks awesome for, time thanks for enjoy, enjoyed it very much yeah that's great let's let's start we'll start in the boring way you know the, the way that we i don't know that we need to but it, it's an easy place to start which is your martial arts background and we'll see where that takes us so how how'd you get started well um so was always interested in martial arts um even even as a child mm -hmm. i uh was of course watched Every martial arts show that I could, or you know, movie they that came yeah. out, especially. Did you, you know, have a favorite? Um, probably at the time, growing up was probably Enter the Dragon was yeah. was was one of my favorite. I loved watching Bruce Lee when I was you know when I was younger. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, aged myself a little bit as far as you know some of those goes. You know, I mean, of course, you know, then of course the the cartoons which I loved, you know, loved Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles when it first came out. <laughs> You know, the original is not the right. you know, new updated. Some of the new stuff's okay, but there's my, my heart's always going to have a special place yeah, for those originals. You know, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, and then when I, as I grew up and things, I mean, I had an interest, but never really followed it. Hmm. Um, I didn't really get into any type of actually martial arts training um, until the Marines. Hmm. Um, so hmm. when I was, I was signed up for a delayed injury program at 17. Um, left as soon as I turned 18, pretty much. Um, and uh, that was one of my favorite parts of being in the Marines was, you know, the, the physical and the hand-to-hand. Mm. -hand. Um, why, why did you want to go into the military? You come from a military family? Or? come from a huge military family. Yeah. Everybody in the family was, has been military. Okay. Um, my, my father was Navy. My grandfather was Navy. My godfather was Navy. And, um, and they let you own. and they let you go in as a marine. Well, yeah, my my uncle was my uncles. They were all either Air Force or Army, mm -hmm. um, you know. So I mean, all the way around. And they, uh, I remember when my uh, right after graduation, I called my uncle and he's like, "I'm really proud of you." He goes, "Man, uh, I was I'm the only one that's ever gone Marines." Mm -hmm. And so he was just like, "But you just you had to show up the rest of us, didn't you?" So I mean, it was a it was a pretty good feeling, and you know, coming from. Um, both ones that had served and also was some of them, like my godfather and my grandfather, they were both, um, World War II vets, you know, and so it was, a uh, pretty awesome like that. And so I, I figured, yeah, I needed to go in the military, you know, had that, that calling for it and I chose the Marines. Okay. 
Yeah, probably because probably they had the better uniforms, you know, and looks better. But, you know, hey, whatever reason there was, um, it worked out well. Taught me a lot. You know, I really, really got interested in um, even more so into um, the the, phys the physical training, the, you know, of martial arts and, as well as, you know, the, the combat side of it mm -hmm. where it's like, okay, I... I want to learn more. So, so that was your first experience with hand. -to -hand. That, was, that was the first, the first real experience with, um, with being taught a hand to hand. Yeah. I, I, I had plenty of little episodes and, you know, all the occasions we, in high school. Should we talk about that? Well, there's, there's, <laughs> there's a smile. It's not even the smile in your in your no. on your mouth. It's the smile in your eyes that tells yeah. me there might be something we should talk about. Well, you know, my, I've always been small. Um, I'm. You know, currently a whopping five five two, um, and I've always been smaller. And my grandfather was the one that actually taught me about that. He used to call me little one, and he was the one that uh, really embedded into my head that you know, if when you're getting picked on or if you ever have to defend yourself, there's no such thing as a fair fight. He goes, you use whatever is necessary to deal with your to to equalize that. Yeah, and I carried that through. Um, the unfortunate part is. I grew up in an area that was, I think out of, in my high school, I think we had about 450, 500 kids. Mm. And I'm pretty sure that school. at the time there was um, eight, between eight to 10 minorities. Mm. Um, <laughs> of, so of, of any, not, any not, and all minorities, uh, inclusive. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so... Um, I, I grew up with dealing with a lot of things there mm -hmm. and, uh, carried, unfortunately, quite a bit of anger over racial issues and some other things. And, and, and so, your background is, um, I am, uh, Yaki part, half Yaki, um, which is a tribe that is, um, basically Northern Mexico, Arizona, and Texas. Um, I grew up that way. Um, well, actually I didn't know at the time. Um. Everybody thought I was Hispanic right? sure. because I was adopted when I was about three months old and my mother's Hispanic. My, my father's white, um, which created an interesting that they had a whole different story all by themselves. Mm -hmm. I'm I, I don't know how they made it through the times because they grew up obviously in the sixties and seventies when, um, interracial mixed couple, yeah. um, my mother's Roman Catholic, my father's Southern Baptist. Um, and you know, so they kind of defied everything from the very beginning. So I grew up in a, in a, in a mixed family and understanding that it, none of that matters. You know? And unfortunately when I, you know, in school and things, well, but it, I had, to I, yeah, it had matters to other people. And so I grew up with quite a bit of anger, a lot of, a lot of, you know, basically hate about a lot of the ways mm -hmm. I was treated. So lots of fights in high school, um, you know, to the point where I was like, okay, um, now, now, let's if, if we kind of want to talk about that for a little bit because we've had others on the show that fighting was part of their youth, but they don't. Not not everyone who thought as a kid, and, and, and I'm going to guess felt like they had to had to fight. You know, it sounds like that describes you. Had the same perception of violence, right? Sometimes people. The moment they can get out of that world, never want to be violent again, right? So you're going into the military, which, you know, not necessarily violent, but is combative, right? So you clearly weren't one of those. You couldn't say, okay, I'm, I'm a pacifist now. A lot of times folks come through that and they become, and, and a little bit of a spoiler, because I did talk to your wife a bit yesterday, Bit of a guardian mindset, not wanting others to go through that. Right. Yeah. So, so did had that had that attitude? Did that exist back then too? Were you protective of others? Yeah. Yeah. We still still yeah. predominantly protective, especially family. Sure. Um, you know, chose part of the. You know, I. I look back at it. I mean, we joked around about the uniform and things like that, but part of the reason, you know, I, I went with the Marines is that, um, more prone to combative or, you know, honestly violent type. 
-hmm. So I figured, you know, what better way to, to also better myself in that if I'm, I'm going into something that's going to go along those lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My father wasn't very happy with it. He was, he was all about, oh, you know, all you're going to be is, you know, combat or you're just always going to be a rifleman and you know i want you to go in the navy where you can get education where you can do all these things and it's like well that's great but no i want the on on the you, ground you want know, boots on the ground yeah. yeah that's why i chose that in fact my mos's were um was infantry i was um special weapon security for the first year and a half and then when i was um after leaving that went to uh, uh third battalion first marines was the infantry unit was assigned to um, with a special operations group was assigned to Force Recon for um, for their backup missions as well as um, mid, uh, Marine Expeditionary Unit mm -hmm. special operations. So spent the last two years, um, you know, predominantly gone a lot and doing all kinds of fun stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. um, you know, after I left the Marines, um, I went. Two years with sub base police. I spent multiple years with um, after that with um, everything from casino security to. Why did you leave the Marines? Um, you know, it was it was a choice in dealing with family. Okay. It was more one of those that I look back. I should have just stayed in. I would have been better off. Mm -hmm. I was doing everything I loved doing, but um, some some issues with um, my you know, my first wife and things like that and dealing with family. And yeah, I mean, I understand it now more so because we married, we married out of high school and of course you don't believe it at the time, but looking back is there was huge changes that occurred. The military changes a lot for sure. you. And a lot of people don't realize that and think, Oh no, I'm good. There's nothing's changed. I'm, you know, same person. No, you're not. <laughs> it changes everything for you. And you know, my last year in, I was home, what, six weeks out of the whole year. And it's hard to maintain yeah. any kind of relationship. Yeah. With spe especially with, you know, two children. And they, it was just it. She had said that, you know, hey, can't do this if we're going to, you know, continue this and can't deal with your enlisting and re enlisting and so forth. So I got out. We separated six months later. I should have just stayed in, <laughs> um, you know, and. In fact, when 9-11 uh, happened, I just about re-enlisted again and just about went. But, you know, um, after I got out of the military, I mean, I went to, obviously, I mean, like you said, guardianship type roles. That's where I was drawn to, mm -hmm. security or law enforcement. Um, spent time, you know, casino security, um, um, body, bodyguard and VIP security. Was trained with that. Um, since that point in time, I've also... Let me see. Um, just some some general type security, like property type, but um, the biggest ones were uh, I spent um, three years with juvenile corrections, mm -hmm. um, and then another six years as um, a security security lead supervisor for um, uh, hospital security. So lots of that was an eye opener in itself, right there, because yeah, a lot of people don't realize exactly how how violent and how necessary security is in a hospital and how hamstrung yeah people are and, yeah. and th this is something that if you if you dig into medical related strikes and and, and you know you, you don't know most of the audience doesn't know I, I live just a few miles from the big hospital in vermont which you know is a small hospital in the rest of the world but you know it, it's the big hospital in vermont and so anytime anything's going on with contract negotiations and looming strikes, the, some of the details end up in the news. And one of the things that I see time and time again is we're not feeling safe. We're not feeling right as, as you know, especially nurses get the short end of the stick. And they're they getting beat on constantly. So we do national statistics show that approximately 80% of nurses nationwide, um, will be the, will be the, unfortunately the victim or have been victims of assault. That's, um, in, that's insane. It, it's a higher percentage than, than law enforcement or other security or anything else, you know? So, um, is there yeah. any, is there any, does gender play a role in that at all? Right. Is it, 
you know, because if we take a big step back, we think about self-defense, right? It's generally man assaulting woman. Is it still the same? It's the same. Yeah, because a lot of the patients um, that do assault are male. Mm -hmm. um, they see the females as an easier target. Um, but at the same time, um, we've had plenty of the males assaulted also because um, they're working a lot of times in what a lot of people still consider a female female role. So then, of course, if you're male, well, you you're know, perceived. you're you're girly, you're you're working, you know, yeah. in something that's female orientated, and so they 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 get targeted also. You know, um, my last uh, then going from the hospital, I left there after six years. Um, the uh, while I was at the hospital, I also was still besides security itself. Um, I also helped develop and also then taught the uh, violence prevention program to the medical staff. Mm. So that that role kind of kind of continued because it's not only am I going to be there to help you, but I'm going to teach you some of the things that are going to help you prevent possibly being a victim or possibly mm. those violent acts towards you. You know, not only just the physical, but also here's here's the signs to watch for, the awareness, how to de-escalate, and then how to, if necessary, all right, now I have to physically deal with it. Yeah. You know, so the fact that the, the um, you know, a lot of the nurses really, our staff really benefited from that because they used some of the same techniques and actually were able to defend themselves, you know, effectively, but also without necessarily hurting the patients, without you know, and themselves getting seriously hurt like a lot of them had before. Um, you know, and then my, from the hospital after I left there, um, well, my last two years at the hospital and then for the um, almost five years after that, I uh, was uh, involved with bail enforcement. So fugitive recovery. That's, an, so, that's an intense <laughs> role. I, I know people who have worked in that yeah, field. Yeah. And let, let, let me ask, were, were you... Were you missing intensity? Were you missing the action? Um, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Because there's a, a large amount of time. It's nothing's going on. You're just a lot of surveillance, a lot of tracking people down. You know, um, it was always funny because people would ask, you know, what do you do for what do you do for a living now? Besides, you know, teach martial arts. And I was like, um, well, I I hunt people down. I hunt people for a living, and they just look at me like. What? <laughs> what do you mean? I was like, no, that's literally the job. I, I hunt people down that, you know, and the, um, the job itself, I mean, when you, when it's not surveillance and when you actually have to go in after somebody, whether it's, you know, just knocking on the door, I mean, there's a huge adrenaline rush just in that alone because you never know what's on the other side of that. You know, I mean, obviously the adrenaline rushes are okay. They don't answer. So now I get to kick the door in or, you know, we're going to, you know, be fighting about it and things and um you know the martial arts um and all the training helped helped a lot with that you know because for some reason people that miss that miss court and you know or that have been bailed out and they don't want to go back to jail huh say so, yeah, it's weird <laughs> interesting <laughs> yeah so, so, so they're willing to do some things yeah yeah i mean you know and 80 percent of them they go without a problem they they're they're like oh yeah, oh, you got me. It got me. There's about the other ten. There's ten percent after that that resist a little bit. It's you know, a good number. But it's it's not a major resistance. And then there's that last, you know, ten percent that's like, oh no, I'm not going. We're gonna fight. It's like, oh okay, well we can go that route. It'd be a bad day for you, but all right, we'll we'll go. And uh, you know, um, so job wise, that's I've pretty much been in. Uh, Either, like you said, a guardianship type role yeah. or um, hands on or, you know, in, in in occupations that have had the potential of violent encounters, you know. Um, you mentioned in there that at the time you were doing bail work, you were teaching martial arts, but we didn't hear no, when you no, started. So, so yeah, where, yeah. Where, did, so where did martial arts start for you? I started, um, and I'd taken throughout, after the Marines, I had gotten... Um, I had taken a little bit of time in, in different arts. Um, I took some Aikido for a little bit. Um, I uh, spent about uh, maybe six months in Taekwondo, and that was enough of that. Um, the uh, Taekwondo, I mean, it had, it had its merits and things, but for me especially, um, 
you know, at least the school I went to, Taekwondo focuses really heavily on the kicks and everything, mm-hmm. which, which, which is great. All right. But no, I like being hands on, hands on, close in. And were, were you, know, you in, in, with that, so. in an ITF school or uh, what's now WT? You know, we're, we're, we're punching to the head. Acceptable um, in sparring. Yeah, it was. Okay, we, so, we so that. That, I was trying to remember back because that was that was a while back. Okay, so probably, that probably, one, so. probably in, in ITF or eight or eight. Yeah. So, um, like I said, spent spent some time learning keto. Um, I. Uh, through a private instructor um, that was that was prior military, um, I did um, do about a year of kendo, mm-hmm. um, which was which was always fun learning learning the swords. Yeah. Um, the uh, that was my very first humbling experience. Um, I mean, major humbling with with martial mm-hmm. arts because you know it was actually right after the right after the Marines. It was about two years after the Marines, and mm-hmm. um, you know. I'm a Marine. I, yeah, I may have come out of there just a little cocky, a little bit, you know, hey, you know, I'm a Marine. I'm a badass. Guess what? Right, right. All right. So we were, uh, that's where, and I still relate the story to my students, is that um, never assume because they're older or never assume that your instructor, you know, because you get one over on him, has taught you everything. Or that doesn't have little things that they're, they're holding on to. And uh, we're going through and... Uh, we come at each other, and I mean, beautiful strike right, 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 right across the midsection from him. You know, and I, I got a little cocky. I was like, you know, yeah, that's right. Right? He's like, okay, let's go again. Um, I came at him, and he busted me on top of the head. Are you using point, shenanigans? Oh yeah, with okay. shenanigans. And there right. it is. Like, at least there's, at least yeah. there's shenanigans in those. You know, so that doesn't that doesn't stop. Okay, the pain. All right, let me tell you, they they will <laughs> well, still leave a wealth no, on no. top of your head. It just it sets the tone, right? Because yes. I've been I've been hit with a shenanigan a time or two, and it's uh it's an experience. Yeah, yeah. They uh, at least on top of my head, it didn't pinch the it pinched the skin like you know have you get hit in the arms or anything, but. Um, he nailed me on top, right on top of the head. He put me down to my knees. I mean, immediately a little goose egg right on top. And that was the point in time where he, he looked at me and goes, I haven't taught you everything. Don't assume. I was like, Whew. yeah, yeah, that was. And know. so what, what was your, your emotional response to that? Right. Cause if you're there, if you're feeling cocky, did you get angry or? Is no, that no, a... I didn't get angry at all. It was a, it was a sudden realization that yeah. the epiphany moment, yeah. like, Whoa, yeah, maybe I should, uh. Maybe I should, you know, keep my mouth shut and just <laughs> learn and not get all like, sure. yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, so that was, and that actually helped me a lot after that, just that one moment, because I approached martial arts and everything after that, much more humble attitude mm-hmm. is like, what can I learn? Mm-hmm. Who can I learn? You know, who can I learn quality stuff from and actually, you know, implement that. So, um, in 2009, um, I actually started Kaji Kembo under the Academy of Kung Fu in Longview, Washington. So was um, this, you know, you found Kaji Kembo as you're searching? Because I'm getting the sense you were yeah, searching. You knew yeah, you I, wanted I, something I knew, combative. So in actual, I, I had started in 2001. Okay. And I was still younger at the time. I let some things get in the way. Yeah. Um, primarily, I when I started in 2001, I uh, and one of those I not to my own horn or anything, but I, I I excel extremely fast in in learning, learning the cause, you know, the forms, learning the self defense, and it was one of those that I wanted to learn as much as possible. And the way to do that is, you know, my instructor at the time is like, no, you know, here's. You have time with me, but here's a, here's your advanced students also that can help you out. Yeah. Um, and the unfortunate part is it reminded me similar of when growing up in, in school mm-hmm. is some of the advanced students were very much against somebody moving forward faster than what they did. Mm-hmm. And they, they, they were, some of them were very adamant about, well, I'm not going to teach you anything or, you know, criticizing and things. And so it... I let that get to me and I stopped. Um, I started back up, I'm sorry, it wasn't 2009, I started back up in 2005 and with a whole new dedication to it and I said, you know, no, I miss it, I want back in there. So I, I went back to the same school, I started back up um, and 
you know, told my instructors, like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to finish this. Told myself, I'm going to finish this. Um, the Kaji Kimbo usually takes five years for a black belt. Um, I made it in four years and three months because I mean, I dedicated the point. I was there sometimes, you know, three, three times a week, sometimes five, five times a week. And then as I advanced more, you know, was assistant instructing and, um, moving up that way. And, you know, push myself to the point that it's like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to finish this. So, so I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. We've had a few people on over the years that have come out of Kaji Kembo. And I, I being a, an East Coast guy, you know, we don't have nearly as much Kaji Kembo over, over there as, as you all do here. But the folks that I've talked to who came through a Kaji Kembo school, most of them, seem to come from backgrounds that are a little rougher around the edges versus other traditional arts, right? And, and I've got a very limited sample set here, but your laugh tells me maybe my observation is accurate. Yeah. So, um, Kaji Kimba, when it was first started, was started basically in 1947, 1949. It was, that's when it was developed. In um, Hawaii. In Hawaii. Yeah. Palama Settlement, Oahu, Hawaii. So when it was developed, um, the, the thing is it was, there was, there was five, there was five gentlemen that got together and they, they had experience and, you know, proficiency in basically five different arts. So it's made up of karate, judo, jujitsu, kempo, and, um, Chinese boxing, kung fu. All right. The, uh, the primary breakdown of it is that the, the kicks, all right, especially the thrust and the, all the power kicks are karate based. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the hand strikes and the, the multiple strikes are the Kempo side of it. Mm -hmm. Judo and Jiu Jitsu, we do have throws and locks, you know, holes that can come in from that. And then our animal forms, a lot of the flowing technique comes from the, the Kung Fu side. So it's this this blend of air, I, I can flow and everything moves along, and then all of a sudden, you know, it comes into those hard strikes. Mm -hmm. um, the it was broken down eventually over the years got broken down into four different styles. There's original Kacha Kimbo, there's one hop Kondo and there's Chuan Fa. And then the fourth division was, um, Tum Pai. Mm -hmm. And the thing that separates Tum Pai that's right. that's from, yeah, from there is that Tum Pai is the only, um, recognized soft style. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's considered a soft style, not because, you know, of course, you know, anyone that understands the difference between hard style and soft style, you know, understands that soft style doesn't mean that it's going to be any easier or any that you're going to hit hard or softer than anything else. It just means that the way that I'm going to employ things is going to be different. I don't, I don't focus on power versus power. It's going mm -hmm. to be flowing techniques that involve voiding and opening up and using their, their speed, their momentum, their power against them more. Okay. So I, I've, I've always, I shouldn't say always, but I think of soft styles as more circles versus straights and angles and edges. Yeah. It's going to be a lot more of, um, you know, those, those, those flowing around things. And mm -hmm. so what Tum Pai means is central way. And so the, the theory behind it is that I move around their center or I move around my center. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, like you said, it's a, that flowing, I'm moving around more. Yeah. Um, the other thing that separated Tum Pai from everything else was it, um, implemented and involved, uh, adding in Tai Chi. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our form has the Tai Chi aspects implemented and, um, you know, um, blended in with it. So a lot of those, those techniques that they use that were all hard side, like you said, where it goes linear, I may move linear, but I'm going to open that up. And the way I put it to my students, it's like a bullfighter. What does a bullfighter do? All right. They're standing there. They wait till that bull is just about there. And at the last minute, they just do a simple turn, pull that, um, pull that flag back, you know, and bull goes right on through. All right. That's, that's more the way that the Tumpai is. It's, it was designed to not stop and counter their movement, but to allow their movement to continue. And then you redirect or, you know, mess up their whole movement as their, as it continues. Um, so that was, you know, that was a little bit different. And the, as far as the Kaju Kimbo side of it, when you said it's a little rougher around the edges, when it was first started, 
Um, the basic way they did is they trained it. Um, they got to the point where, okay, this is, this is where we want to be with it. All right. Well, how do we effectively make sure this works? Yeah. Um, right. We're going to go, we're basically going to go find a fight in town, right. create one or, you know, if, if need be, and then we're going to test the technique. Yeah. If it works, we're keeping it. If it doesn't work, we're scrapping it because it's not going to be effective for the street or for, you know, actual self-defense. So that's the way they, they developed the system. But the other thing is the original school, um, the, the stories that go with it is that, um, if there wasn't, if there wasn't some blood on the mat, they weren't done training. Mm. And that was their way of you know, dealing with it, to, to harden that, to make sure that, okay, no, that the people that are going through this, you're going to, you're going to earn that and you're going to, it's, it was designed to be more of a defensive and more of a, um, a street art rather than competition or sport type art. There was nothing, the originals, there was nothing sport about it. It was just all, we're going to break things. We're going to hurt you. Okay. Wrong one to pick on along yeah. those lines. So yeah, it, it was, it was very much developed around that, that aspect. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you know John Hackleman. Yep. When, when, when the pit master was on the show, he talked to, talked a bit more about, about those early days and, and, Fascinating, fascinating stories, and just when, when I think of a, a quintessential Kaji Kembo person, like it's 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 him, right? He, yeah. Listen to the way he talks, and and he talks a little bit differently than you would think of a lot of martial artists talking about combat. Yeah, it's uh, um, you know. So I went through. I I received my my first degree in two thousand nine. Um. And then from there, you know, started teaching. Um, I've had two schools. I had one school that I had um, for about a, about a year and a half. And then I had to close it because when I was working at the hospital, the schedule was just, mm. was crazy. Um, you know, I'd, I'd work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, have like Thursday, Friday off, and then work Saturday, Sunday, and then have the following week. It was always, it was always opposite days off each mm. week. So that's real difficult to run a school when people look kind of looking at consistency and right. well, this week I can train on Tuesday and Wednesday, but next week I can't train until Thursday and Friday and it doesn't work so well. So I, I closed that and um, in the end of 2021, you know, um, and you said like you will go back on that because you said you had talked to my, my wife and uh, Michaela. And so Michaela and I met at the hospital. All right. She told you that um, I'm the one that, you know, saved her butt quite a few different times from, you know, from some patients and from some situations. Um, her favorite one, of course, is we had to deal with um, a very large gentleman. He was about 6'3", six, 6'4", six, and easily about 320 pounds. It's a big guy. And, uh, yeah, and, I mean, everybody, the, the funny part is everybody referred to him um, as Haggard from a, a Harry Potter. Cause he was about, yeah, that's what it was about that size. Wow. Okay. Um, fairly violent past mm -hmm. had, had, you know, mental health issues and some other things. And so, I mean, could be very violent and very scary just in size alone. Mm -hmm. And, um, there was one, of the, one of the times he was, he was on a hold. He wasn't allowed to leave. And he's myself and my, uh, my partner, which was, was Chris Moore, which is one of my favorite partners ever because he, him and I pretty much, we meshed, we, we had our moments, we didn't necessarily agree with things, but we, we meshed really well as far as work goes. We, we understood each other. It was one of those partners that I didn't have to think about what he was going to do. He didn't have to think about what I was going to do. We knew exactly how this was going to go down and, um, two complete opposites mm -hmm. because, you know, I'm, I'm native and, you know, Spanish, you know, long hair. Um, he's, um, he's white tattoos all over the place, short hair. He was army. I was Marines. Um, and, uh, you guys gave yeah. each other a lot of crap. Oh, we gave a lot, yeah. a lot of crap, but it was yeah. a complete opposites because we've, we dealt with like racial issues or anything. There was, there was times that I'd have skinheads in there. Didn't like me, loved him. He mm -hmm. fits the profile opposite Hispanic or native. They loved me. They didn't want anything to do with him. So it, it was a really good working relationship. And we, we were in there talking with him he said, he's leaving. I said, well, you know, no, I'm just, unfortunately you can't doc said, you have to stay. And he said, he's leaving. Michaela was his nurse. He jumps up and 
literally, I grab an arm, Chris grabs an arm, and he slides us about five feet back. I mean, just moving forward, all right, across the room. Mm-hmm. Michaela, my loving, beautiful wife, all right, she decides the best way to contain this man, all right, and to make sure that he doesn't get out and everything else, is she just shuts the sliding door behind us and puts her foot into it so that the door won't open. So she basically just locks us in there. She's on the there. outside. Yeah, she's on the outside, locks us in there with it. I'm like, really? That's great. Awesome. It's a lot of, it's a lot of faith a, or yeah, sacrificial. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure how to interpret that. I'm not that. sure which one it was, yeah. but at the time, he slid us back till both of our feet hit the door. And about that point in time, I was like, okay, now, we, now it's our turn. And needless to say, he ended up on the ground in restraints and everything else. And no, no. You know, if, if I may, if you're willing to, to talk about it, that's a dramatic situation and you know i'm sure there are plenty of people watching who would assume the full complement of material that you have available is an option but being that you are at work in a medical setting my understanding is all of that material is not available to you that you have no no. certain avenues that you can approach this problem how did you approach it um we both had an arm okay and it was one of those that you know we 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 attempted to push back on him. He has enough weight, enough power that he that's not going to work. Mm-hmm. Um, so our job was restraint was control and restraint. Mm-hmm. And it's, I teach on three different levels. There's the first level, which is um, escape. Mm-hmm. Um, the second level is control and restraint, right? And then the third, as I like to put, it, is just destruction. You know, um, nurses and like women's self defense and things. This it's escape. You're not going to go hand to hand or fight this fight this person for a long period of time. You want to get out of that situation. Restraint is what security, you know, a lot of times law enforcement deals with. Mm-hmm. That destruction is is that complete self defense where now I have to I have no concern or care for their welfare anymore. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to do whatever's necessary. Knives, guns, you know, you, you are, can't are and you can't threat. Be there. You can't operate at that level. No, you can't. Side. You know, unless of course there was, you know lethal lethal threat that was involved um but pretty much you know attempt to push back and everything like that i was like nope not happening so basically i i simply reach reach between legs grab the back back of his leg right high high up on the leg where Mm -hmm. it 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 pinched enough that you know he Mm -hmm. he lifted that leg Mm -hmm. just enough balance shifted and he's going down to the Mm -hmm. floor you know it's it's crazy because once he went bent down the floor i mean we you know it went all the way to the back wall, you know, and he's crammed Big in there. Big fall hard. He, he's crammed in there, basically turned him into the pretzel into the fetal position. He's all crammed in there, and, um, you know, we get control of him, get him up there, and, um, you know, but it was one of those simple little techniques that you wouldn't think would, when most people would never think of. It was just one of those, like, okay, well, where do, where do I know pressure points are? Where do I know that it's going to hurt? You know, and even if it's enough just to shift that weight as big as he is. Um, it was my fa- my Taekwondo yeah. instructor's favorite. Yeah. Self-defense. Get a little bit of skin on the oh, inside yeah. of the thigh. And, and, or, if, or if, if they're not arm, expecting like, it, it changes the dynamic yeah, Because rapidly. if they lift that foot at all, yeah. now the whole balance shifts. And, he, you know, we got him down there. Um, the funniest part is once I, once we had him down is to to control the arm, things like that. I got hold the, I got hold of the fingers. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, the funny, but the really funny part is um, later on, um, Michaela went to go check on him. And of course, he's sitting there. And it was a complete change around because he's sitting there like a little, you know, like a little six or seven year old mm-hmm. kid just holding on his finger, boo boo lip, and everything like that. And she's like, You're all right? And he's like, The native broke my fingers. <laughs> it's like, Oh, well, there's, there's that. And, um, but yeah, we, we, we met at the hospital um, and she decided to really start martial arts again. She had taken Taekwondo and because of an injury it stopped, but she really decided to start martial arts after seeing the way that that went and after um, things went along that line, she wanted to learn more um, and then- To stay safe at work. To stay safe at work primarily. And the, um, she unfortunately had dealt with the um, pretty mentally and other types of abusive relationship mm-hmm. prior prior to me, um, in which she finally realized and got out of. And so she basically wanted to make sure that she no longer 
was was hoping to get over the fears of that and yeah. to deal with you know the the insecurities along with that um 2021 she finally convinced me um she goes you're really good at teaching why don't you open a school again at times i had all kinds of excuses well you know i don't have the time i don't i don't necessarily have the space i don't i want to dedicate everything to this it's a big commitment and it, it, it is and, and, and you and you knew that commitment because you oh yeah done it before. Done before plenty of people go in their first time they're like yeah this is gonna be great and then they realize whoa well my first school had a total between the the adults and the kids um i think it only had 15 students 15 15 to 20 at the most um, still a lot of you work. know i mean it's a lot of work it, it's, it's, it's still a lot it's still a lot of work but when i opened I, I finally listened to her and Kaya stopped with the excuses and said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to teach again. And we started off in the garage, mm -hmm. which was, um, basically what, like a, uh, 10 by 12 foot training area, mm -hmm. you know? So small, we start off with Maybe about my, the size uh, of this room. Uh, yeah, night, night. Yeah. Night, pretty night. Night. much from the front of the counter, oh, maybe okay. over to the door. Okay. It wasn't, yeah. wasn't huge. Um, my two children, um, Kaden is now 14, McKinsey is 12, and they had both been involved in martial arts in my first school. They've been, they've been taught by me throughout the period of time, um, you know, since they were about five and six. Mm -hmm. And so they were my first new students again. Um, and they, they both, they both excel at it. Mm -hmm. I like to say it's strong genetics and that they, you know, just pick that up, but they both understand it. They both excel at it. Um, and so I had them, I had another student that, that came to us from another school that, um, was friends of the family. So I started off with three students and in about, we opened in July of 21 and by March of 22, we had I think five students. All right. So it's growing. Um, by the mid part of 22, we had, it was getting up to where we almost had 10 students. Um, there was one that was kind of in and out. So we had nine to 10 students right there. And I was like, starting to, I was like, um, I, I, can't, I, I can't fit any more in here. Yeah. It's like, I'm, I'm going to run into a problem. And that's no advertising. I'm just like, okay, I'm getting people with word of mouth. And so I need to look at something. Luckily, when we bought our property, it had this really nice, huge shop up there. They had, um, a granite business and they had a trucking business. Mm -hmm. So it was a big enough base to be able to pull semis into. So I had a really nice, you know, huge shop area. So we're like, we're going to turn it into a school. Started framing off on the, all the walls, got everything situated. Um, the floor was, um, is it 20, was it 22 by 20 foot. So it's basically nice. double the size of the garage. Yeah. All right. Okay. Now we're going good. Um, still no advertising. I, uh, Word of mouth alone, it went from 10 to um, 22 students, right? By the end of, um, by the end of 22, we, that's where we're at. In um, 20, let me see, this is October. So midway through 23, I had to expand into the other bay. Um, so it jumped from a 22 by 20 to a 22 by 40 foot space. And, um, I now have 56 students, That's great. you know, within a year. And so, I mean, it was like, um, yeah, and it's still no advertising that they've been talking to me. We need to do advertising now to bring more students in because my more ones are advancing to bring new ones in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's this part of like, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, a real business. It's a, it's a real good problem to have, yeah. but at the same time, I'm like, all right, now where am I going to expand to? Because now I'm going to have to tear off possibly out this other wall and do some more expansion as I get more in. But it's, it, you know, it's three times the size of my original school. Um, it's it's moving forward great. I have everything from ages, um, my youngest is age six, and my oldest is age 73. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, um, we, we have, quite a range and uh, the crazy part is most of a large amount of our especially adults are female which is a little different because most of the especially when you go to Kaj Kimbo most of them are male most schools are male most martial arts schools in general, in general are 
yeah. are, are, are male, but to have yeah. most students being female, yeah. that's interesting. Nope, what do you chalk that up to? Um, well, I have a lovely, um, I have an awesome wife that is, is great at promoting. Okay. But she, she's recruiting them? Yeah, yeah, she recruits. But the other thing is, um, we actually have gotten to quite a few um, from their kids' training. Hmm. They see their kids train. They they are interested themselves. They see the way that you know. Myself as an instructor, I have my other two instructors um, are both second degree black belts in uh, in Kaiju Kimbo, and they um, are both female. So you know we have a good mix because we have male and female instructors. Um, you know the kids that are there, pretty good blend of everything, and um, some of them have come from also like our when we've done women's self defense. Yeah. I've seen that the way that that's taught and want to learn they want to continue learning more where they feel that safe and that security, you know, that they didn't feel before. So we've gotten a lot from those aspects there. The number one correlation I see with the, the male female mix in a school is, is there senior leadership? Are there, there are females at the front of the room? If there are, I generally see 50, 50, right? If there aren't, I generally see 90, 10, 80, 20. Yeah. Yeah, our mix on male to female, as far as um, on the adult side of it and teens, is it's honestly about 70 30. That's cool. Female. But that, that, you know, that's a whole different energy. Yeah. It is. And, um, you know, it it's really helped me have a better understanding of how to, how to teach. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, males, like I have one that's, that's, that's prior military, retired gunnery sergeant from the Marine Corps. He was, he was I, here yesterday. Yeah, he was here yesterday. He's, 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 he's an interesting he's, he's man. I like the, One of the last men you'll want him, you know, <laughs> you'll, yeah. you'll think is an easy target because it'll be a bad day. Yeah. Um, but, you know, obviously I can talk with him differently and train with him differently than necessarily I, I can with um, a female that's had a very traumatic in, incidences, you know. And you have, you, you realize that you have to not necessarily treat them differently because you don't want to ever sit there and, oh, well, they're more frail or they're anything like this because they're not. It's just they have triggers or things that you have to be more aware of in things that you do. Right. The way you, you know, convey that information right. has to it has to acknowledge the reality of right. the student. You know, and the, 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 real, the other reality of it is the physical aspect, okay? If, if I grab you by your wrist, you're probably going to be okay with it, all right? But, you know... And even males, but I mean, anyone that's been in a traumatic situation where they've been, where there's been abused or they've been attacked in that fashion, now I grab hold of you that way, it can trigger a response that, you know, you better be prepared for because everything else you know, that went along with that prior experience all comes of a sudden flooding yeah, back. Yep. Yeah, you know, and so, you know, it's been a, it's been a really good learning curve for me as an instructor, also understanding all aspects of how people, um, respond mm -hmm. as well as how to relate to them in dealing with different aspects okay of experience um unfortunately traumatic experiences that they've had their backgrounds you know and um you know and just really understanding how to how to relate to everybody mm -hmm. um so and i like to say i do a pretty good job of it at least that's what my students all it, tell it, me it so, sounds like it. I mean, <laughs> so, if, if you're yeah if you've got women coming in and they're remaining, you're doing something right with that. Let's hope so. You know, I mean, like I said, a lot of them have commented how things have already changed for them. And mm -hmm. it's, there's been evident you know, evidence of, you know, of these changes mm -hmm. in the way that they act, the way they, they hold themselves. And, um, you know, the, they're much more aggressive, much more outgoing, much, much more uh, along the lines of, okay, they, they've started developing that, that confidence, mm -hmm. that, you know, increase in self-esteem and that, that feeling of safety and security. So it's always been a positive for me on that. What do you do differently now as an instructor as you've wrapped your head around this general subject of, you know, accommodating people who've been through trauma? What are you doing now that's different than maybe you did a couple of years ago or even your, your first school? Um, especially from... And a large amount of it came from from the hospital is is a much more uh, is a greater sense of empathy with it mm. um, whereas my students you know the the term sensei or sifu either direction Chinese or Japanese I mean primarily primarily means instructor but it also has 
has that other meaning of basically like a father figure and having a deeper understanding of that has helped me go along with those it's like all right it's not babying or calling them but you have to have that empathy you have to understand kind of what they've gone through right yeah. and sometimes take smaller steps with them right and the expectation is still going to be there but the expectation may be it's going to take us a little bit longer to get there and being patient and understanding with that when i first started not so much the same it's like okay this is the standard this is where we're supposed to be let's go let's move it was more of that, that military aspect mm -hmm. like let's go all right and it it used to frustrate me a little bit when it's like okay why aren't they getting this you know and so since that point in time between my first school and even now you know even though it wasn't terribly long it was only a four year about a four year but i was working in the hospital and you know that actually opened my eyes to a lot of things about how i have to deal with de-escalation how i have to deal and work with patients as well as other staff mm -hmm. um you know i have to have to look at it differently and think about the things that they've been through and you know readjust the way that i talk and, and act with them it's it's funny that we've gotten here because you know folks who've been around in the audience a long time know that i generally have a a problem that's always circulating in the back of my mind, right? What is this thing that I'm trying to figure out, trying to solve for, for a couple of years, it was around ego and, and how our industry approaches ego within the context of training. And right now it's, it's how we approach context, right? I, I grew up, you probably grew up within the martial arts context anyway, that there was no acknowledge, little to no acknowledgement that students didn't have the context of what they were going through because they hadn't gone through it yet. Right. And so as instructors, it was, well, just trust me, I'll get you there, but you have to submit or surrender. You have to, you have to have faith that you are being guided in the right way. And for some people that works. And at a certain time in history, that was more effective than it is today. But what I think we have now is, if people don't have the context for where you're bringing them, we've got to find some other way for them to trust the process that is beyond, well, I just want you to trust me and know that I have your best intentions at heart. And I think what I'm hearing from you is maybe not in those words, but a recognition of that, that instead of you're here, we want to get you there. I'm over there and I'm past that. In fact, because I've, I've been through this, I'm, I just want you to take these really big steps and know that, you know, I'm not going to let you fall. But what I'm hearing is, okay, here's where the next footprint is. I've got you. You need me to hold your hand for that? Okay, cool. You don't? Okay. I've got my hand here. If you need it, I'll support you. Yeah. Now, yeah. um, a lot of my students have, have said one of the things they love the most about the way that I instruct is I explain um, which helps them, you know, and I explain it on, on multiple levels because everybody has a different learning style mm -hmm. and that I, you know, and that I've learned that over, you know, years and years with this is that, um, you have to, you have to be able to appeal and be able to work with them with all the, all the different learning styles. Yeah. Some people, you know, like my son, I can, I can show him and, and, you know, and go through and he will follow one time and he, he'll pick it up. Um, you know, my daughter, um, not quite, not quite the same way. She doesn't always do it that way, but I can tell her and I say it as I'm doing movements and she picks that up and she can follow that. Um, you know, some, some people I can, I can guide them through it. All right. And tell them they can follow me step by step. All right. And they have no, they, it's that, oh, which well, is trust me, follow me. All right. And they go through it, but it has no meaning to them. And then, of course, we break it down, um, you know, and this is what you're doing. All right. This is what these movements are doing. This is how the, this is how this is this applies. And all of a sudden that light bulb kicks in and goes, oh, now that makes sense. Now I understand why I'm doing this. So therefore, now I can I can effectively do it and not just simply just follow those movements. You know, and that was one of the major things as an instructor that, you know, I had had to develop is that, OK, I need to. Be able to work with them on all the levels 
and not just simply, like you said, follow, follow me and trust in the fact that I know, you know, that I know better, yeah. you know, as you know, it's like, no, is this is why we do it. This is, this is, this is what's occurring. You know? And I mean, I even leave it up to, you know, to them. It's like, you know, the, does that make sense? Is there something that you think would work better? You know, and I've had students like, oh yeah, let, you know, I would do this and this. Okay. So let's, 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 let's uh, go over that. Yeah. Right. If you were to actually do this and I did this, would it actually work? Well, yeah, no, it wouldn't work so much. I understand how you came to that, but all right, now do this, this way. And, you know, it's like, oh yeah, that works much better. You know, so I mean, it's, it's also being open to, um, you know, they say that black belt is that is that beginning of the journey. Mm -hmm. Well, part of that journey should also be you being one and opening open to being able to listen to to the other people. You know, whether it's your students, because some of the things I've come up with and some of the things I've learned is from the students. Is you know, even even if if it's, okay, well, this person's left hand they step funny or they do something weird. Okay, now I need to revise certain things. And if I'm working with somebody that's left-handed or what happens, okay, if I'm now having to deal with the defense against that side. So, you know, I mean, it's it's a learning process and it should be where you're open to everything. And like you said, ego, unfortunately, in martial arts, um, it it truly has no purpose in it because, you know, you look back at the, the codes of Bushido and everything else, mm -hmm. being humble was, was the one major, you know, the faucets of that and a lot of instructors a lot of martial artists and everything unfortunately have forgotten that yeah and it's a shame because if if you are teaching in the right way you're learning more than your students yes i believe that wholeheartedly <clears throat> there's a reason that teaching is an inevitable and even required aspect in, I think I can say most martial arts schools, most martial arts progressions, because you learn so much. And if you're not willing to be open when you're in the front of the room, I think you are missing out. I mean, yeah. my best stuff, the stuff that when, it, when I'm traveling, that I'm sharing with folks, the best stuff generally comes from me teaching a class and something happening accidentally. 100% of what I shared yesterday came from accidents in class going, okay, they're not getting it the way I want them to get it. How do I get them from where they are to there? Let's try this. Oh, snap, that worked. Cool. All right. All right. We got to remember that. Let's take some notes on that and let's continue to explore that. Yeah. Right. And, and I'm, a, I'm a better instructor because of it. Yeah. Yeah. The more open you are to, to all avenues, you know, it doesn't mean you have to follow off them, but the more open you are to them, you know, you know, and especially, you know, one of the one of my pet peeves and my frustrations is when, um, you know, it's partially that ego, but it's also mm -hmm. partially that defense of your own art is the is the ones that, oh well, my art's our art's the best, and we've all heard this. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, this art's absolutely pure in itself, and that this is the best one for all these things. It's like, okay, well, basically, there is no pure arts anymore. They've all been influenced, whether they've you know, by other instructors and and when they were created, they were oh yeah, every, every one of them. Go back, read the source material from yeah. everything we have documented. Every single art was cobbled together from other stuff in the same way that Kajikembo was. Right. They just you know did it for longer, and they weren't super forward about oh here's how we came up with the name. Yeah, Kajikembo especially. I mean, we their Tumpai is pretty much the redheaded stepchild of, of the, the Kaji Kimball system. You know, it's one because the other three styles are still hard styles and they, they're very similar. Tumpai shot off and basically carried the foundation, but it made huge changes in the way a lot of it was done. And so, you know, it always, I mean, I've heard the arguments and I've heard, you know, even between the traditionals and things like that of, well, you know, art's this, and it's, yeah. um, you know, we want we don't want to venture, you know, um, move away from from that traditional and everything. And it's like we we don't want we don't include these things, or we don't want to, you know, look at keep an open mind and adding things in. It's like we started off as a mixed martial art. Why why would we be 
why would we have objections to adding more things in or changing aspects when we started off that way and it, the whole thing was developed by taking a whole conglomeration of things and right. shoving it together? And, and my response, I, I think, is even more fundamental. Okay, so you're saying you never want it to get better. Because something can't improve unless it changes. It is a, a, a natural law. Right. That was one of the things with Kaji Campbell and what a lot of them have forgotten is that um, Sijo's uh, Adriano Imperato was, is, is looked at as the primary founder of Kaji Campbell. Um, but unlike a lot of instructors or founders of systems um, that say, okay, well, this is, the, this is the tradition, this is the way it's supposed to be passed down, all the instructors are technically supposed to keep passing it down in this fashion only. He didn't do that. He actually left it open to where the instructors could change things and where they where they could they could alter or add things in if necessary um, for their students and for their own instructor. Most style founders, when we get to you know the original style, not not you know the offshoot of the offshoot of the offshoot, right? But when we go back. I'm not aware of anyone, and someone can check me on this, but I'm not aware of anyone who founded a, you know, macro level style that we still have today that said, this needs to remain perfectly as is for infinity. Right. They all had that attitude of, uh, this is what I put together. Here you go. Run with it and change it, grow it, improve it. Yeah. And the unfortunate part is that somewhere between that point when it started and now you have people in between it's oh it's not supposed to alter it's not supposed to change it's like you know you know the one i find most ironic which one yeah right and and and, you know i and less people think that i'm i'm being critical for me this is a philosophical debate i do see a lot of value in approaching an art as a historical artistic pursuit like here is the heart here are the hard edges of the box what does that look like because that's how I approach forms, kata, right? Like, this is the kata as I was taught. And those edges give me something to explore within. And, and that's fun, right? Like, I okay, so if this is all we had available to us, if I couldn't take in this cool thing I learned over there, how would I solve this problem? Right. And I think academically, that's really, really interesting. I think there's a lot of value to that. We, uh, you know, in, in kata or forms alone, you know, kata of pinions, forms, whatever you whatever you call them in in, in your system, is we, we we played with this yesterday. Yeah. The simple fact, okay, this is this is a form, you know, kata, we can change it, we can add things to it, and it's still gonna have the same primary, all right, foundation, all right. But the other thing is that we did, which a lot of people have lost, is that oh well. These are the techniques, and this is this is this is what this does, and this is the only way that it does this. Well, we did it just yesterday. Okay, um, three different ways of doing the same thing, or the interpretation of like just because I I moved this way now. All right, how many different things can actually be done from that? Right. It's not just simply that form. Why it's not just you... simply this step, and that's the only thing. You know, and there unfortunately there's a lot that. Oh, this is the tradition. This is the way it was passed down, and this is the only way that it can be that it can be used or utilized. I think a lot of people want to be right. I think they want the correct way because then they can check the box and move on. And I I don't believe martial arts is check the box and move on. And for some people, that's really frustrating. Yeah. Well, but I think it's the beauty. Yeah. the The biggest part that they have they have lost is the you know the meaning of martial arts is military arts, combat. There is there is absolutely nothing, all right, that is in the box, perfect round, you know, squared edges about combat. It is going to be the most chaotic, all right, absolutely un in, in it's controlled chaos. Yeah. And there, there's watch there, any video of a, of an actual fight. Yeah. It's there's, it's messy. There is there is no, you know, absolute rights or wrongs. There is there's no you know absolutes when it comes to that. So why if ours are technically military arts, why would we try and say the same thing to try and cram it into one little box, check, like you said, check the boxes, or sit there and assume that, all right, everything that we do is controllable or that it's only one way? Well, it's ego. Right? I mean, that's, that's the only reason. 
Maybe not the only reason. I think that's the main reason. They, for that, people. That they, is, they, want the main to, reason. they want to feel good that, okay, I know this. I've checked this box. I can move on. I can, you know, if this, then that, my rank reflects my boxes being checked, right? How, however, however they're going to look at it. And, you know, I, I would rather someone be training in that way with that stuff than not at all. Right. But I do think you're missing out on a lot, you know, and, and to tell the audience, you know, we, we worked through, we made a, a form, but admittedly short form. We, we worked through it together and there, there were some, we were given some parameters. With two different styles. With two different styles. And, and I, I was trying to adapt my stuff to kind of your philosophy, right? So it didn't feel like Kajakembo move. Karate move, right? Kajakembo move, right? And it and it went through together pretty well. And actually, I can still remember it. And there was yeah. some, there was some fun stuff in there, and you got me thinking, right? And and that's my favorite thing is, okay, your response from here is this. I I see enough of what you were thinking, and that's really interesting to me. And and I like letting the wheels turn, yeah. because. If I come up with something cool enough, if I learn something interesting enough, well, now I'm adapting my own personal art. And I believe everybody has their own personal art because, you know, we're smaller guys. So we're going to solve a problem differently than someone who is 6'4", or yeah. differently than someone who is a 12-year-old child who's, you know, 4'8". Yeah. Right? Like, like. It, it there has to be some level of individualization, and I think ignoring that is is somewhere between sad and foolish. Well, you know, you brought up ego, but it's not always just it's not always ego. Sometimes it's just simply that the instructors haven't been open enough to learn anything else, so they're stuck then with what can I teach them? Well, I can only teach them what I've learned. I don't have anything else to draw from. You know, and the other uh, unfortunate part is that you're you're dealing with a lot of instructors, and it, it's a good thing. It goes back to you know, I, it's better be a you know, a warrior in a garden, all right? Guitar.com. Yeah, right there. But it's it also deals with okay. A lot of instructors in the world yeah. have never actually had to utilize the things, which is great because we want to we want always want to be def defensive and not okay. I'm looking for that fight. But at the same time, there's a lot of things. It's like, and at my seminar yesterday, I brought it up. How many times have you gone through as a student, okay, or even as an instructor, and wondering, was well, this really going to work? So you're just basing on, okay, well, I was taught this way, so I went with my instructor. He said it's going to work. I'm giving it to you, okay, that yes, it's going to work. But there's always going to be that little tiny bit that that's back there, like. I'm not 100%. And the unfortunate part is when you have students that come back and go, that didn't work, right? Now everything starts to collapse on you. And so, you know, the, the best instructors are the ones that actually open themselves up to learn as much as possible. And you may not add, add every bit of it in. You may not be like, oh, I'm cramming all this stuff into my new thing. But, you know, even my, my instructor... Um, you know, I've, I've told him I'm, I'm making alterations. I'm doing things. I'm changing some things. What because, is he, what is he saying? you know, his his response to it is, okay, absolutely. Can you explain why? And, you know, I can explain why. And then when I can explain why and it goes through it, he, he he's accepting of it. Cool. If I couldn't explain why, he'd be like, well, then that doesn't make any sense. If you do not have a valid reason as to why, all right, and how it's going to work, then why change it? You know, and he's, he's very open to it. I mean, he... You know, we teach the curriculum. This is the curriculum of, okay, now here's the adaptions, all right? Because it means that all of a sudden that doesn't work for you, all right? It has to be flowing. It has to be, you're, you're now controlling that chaos that is current. So you have to go into the next steps of whatever it is. Yeah. You know, and a lot of, I know, unfortunately, a lot of schools and a lot of instructors don't train that. And, you know, the unfortunate part is that you know, their their students are kind of stuck only in in that just that one that one lane. There are people who advance the martial arts. There are people who pass on the martial arts, and the people who pass on the arts are still playing an important role because other people train because of them, and maybe one of them advances the arts. Right. Right. We need both. 
if all of us were advancing all, all of the arts all of the time, that's not necessarily the way that we all move forward as well, right? Because what, 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 if, what if all of a sudden yellow belts are advancing the arts and first day white belts are advancing the arts, right? Like th there needs to be a certain amount of context, right? We're, we're coming back to that subject. There certainly needs to be a certain amount of context before you could appropriately ask the why and get good answers coming out. Right. Yeah, that's, you know, and I mean, it's, you know, hopefully I look at it as, you know, I'm, I pass it on, but, you know, at the same time, I want kind of a combination. I okay. want to be able to pass it on, but I also want to be able to advance it to keep that, to keep that level to where, you know, they can feel that they would be effective, to where they can see they would be effective, you know, and, you know, one of my favorite things, honestly, is what ifs. Mm -hmm. I encourage my students on that. It's like, if you have a question, all right, or you get the point and it's not working, all right, ask the what if, or what if, okay, yeah. we don't have a, we don't have a technique for this. What if somebody grabs me like this? Yeah. Um, if I don't have an answer, right, I will, I will actually go through and we create one. Let's, let's figure it out. You know, yeah. Let's figure this out, how this is going to work. Yeah, I encourage my students so. at the end of every class, who has a great question, and that's exactly how I phrase it. And we don't always end class with a great question, but sometimes we do, and they go back and they think, and they feel like they can ask why, or, you know, what about, because some of my students have been in the mix, and, and they, they've, they've had some unfortunate things happen to them. So they've got context. I don't, I'm, if I am not the best person to teach people self-defense, I am a great person to teach you how to not get into a fight in the first place. I've been able to diffuse all that. You have different experiences there, right? So if we're talking about self-defense things, I'm going to prioritize your experience over mine. But if we're talking about de-escalation for teenagers, maybe that's a subject I've got that you don't, exactly. you know, right? Right. And, and, and both are valuable. It's all valuable. Yeah. Because if you can avoid it in the first place, you're great. Right. But, you know, at least have a basic understanding when it doesn't. Exactly. So I guess exactly. I got to be able to do something. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, it's great. This has been a lot of fun. It's been a really good time. I'm going to have you, you know, give the, the final words, which sounds so foreboding. It doesn't mean you're right. going to get stabbed as you walk off camera, but uh, I'll have you close this up with the audience in a moment. But to the audience, oh, uh, if people want to find you. Social, email, web, any um, of that stuff. So it can be found. Um, um, I'm the lead instructor and owner of Grey Wolf Martial Arts in Winlock, Washington. Um, you can find me at greywolfma.com. Um, we also have a Facebook page, which is Grey Wolf uh, Defense and Martial Arts. Uh, we do everything from self-defense, um, Tai Chi. Uh, we run ages from uh, age five all the way up to at least right now, 73. Um, we, uh, you know, also specialize highly in violence prevention um, on both uh, like law enforcement first responders as well as uh, the medical, you know, the main programs like everyone else, uh, you know, women's self-defense, the bully proof programs. Um, but, you know, we also do a really good job of combining here's curriculum and here's, you know, the possibility of real life mm -hmm. of what happens. So um, it can be, contacted you know easily there um the uh, the official the official title is gray wolf defense all right so it can also be found that way um and like i said it's in winlock washington so you can always be contacted there and you know appreciate it very much thank awesome. you awesome thanks thanks absolutely so whistlekick martial arts radio.com is the place to go for transcripts links we'll have all that stuff linked in the show notes photos videos any of that's that stuff we mentioned a few other episodes today you can find all those there we don't put anything behind a paywall whistlekick.com is the place to go to find out about products and and our events right like if you're sitting there going man i i'm in the pacific northwest i didn't know about free training day well you got to get on some email lists you gotta you gotta pay attention to what we're doing because uh i i can't just show up at your house because i don't know where you live and drag you over here as much as i would like to Thank you again to Kataro, K-A-T-A-A-R-O dot com. Use the code WK10 to save 10% on this great hoodie or belts or any of the other cool stuff. They do amazing rank certificates. Like they really do solid stuff. And, and, and the reason I'm so excited that we work with them is because their professional ethos in the martial arts very much lines up with ours about quality and stuff like that. So, but Michael, 
how do you want to close today? What what do you want the audience to consider, remember as we go out the door? You know, the biggest thing is with, with martial arts is is train. Always train. All right. But always also train with an open mind. Is that keep to keep that open that you know, and don't ever get stuck in the oh what this is the this is the one correct style or this is along those lines because unfortunately the people that you may have to defend against have a say in how things go. And so therefore they're not always gonna go according to the way that you've trained if you only if you only go one way. You wanna keep your mind open, you wanna try and take in as much as possible from from all different sources, you know, and you know, even if you don't in, implement everything even tiny bits of that may be very valuable to you in the long run. So, absolutely.